Hello. Hi. Welcome back. Uh, did everybody enjoy lunch? Yes. Yeah? Did everybody enjoy coffee? Yes. Yeah? Uh, if you were lucky, you might have gotten some of this uh, very special coffee that was like custom roasted for us from Cova in Portland. We had about half a pound of it uh, ready to go. But uh, anyway, so if you, if you had like one extremely, really, really special good cup of coffee, that was that. Uh, all right. I had one. That's why I'm so excited right now. Uh, I hope you're excited to hear uh, Daniel's talk. Uh, this is Daniel Worthington. He's going to talk about building Excel in a browser. Oh my gosh. Okay, can everyone hear me all right? Yes? Okay, there we go. Um, okay, so my name's Daniel, and uh, I work at Simply Measured. I do um, product design and development there, and actually for the last year or so, I've basically just been doing JavaScript development. Um, on this project that I'm about to tell you about. So, um, so it's Simply Measured, we love Excel. Um, and one of the reasons we love it is uh, it's basically our product. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm, I'm just gonna tell you about how this product kind of came about, like why did we try to do this, why does it have anything to do with JavaScript, how did it end up in the browser, and then um, I'm gonna get into at the end a little bit about some of the architectural decisions we made and sort of um, some things that might be useful for people who are thinking about building large libraries in JavaScript, which this ended up being a pretty big library. So um, big question, why Excel? Well, um, one thing that's great about Excel is it allows people to kind of focus on data design. So we have analysts who are fluent in Excel and they work with all the data. Um, we do social media analytics. so. Um, we pull in a lot of data from a lot of different data sources, and we've created a whole number of reports in Excel. And so the analysts can sit in Excel, and they're comfortable with it, and it allows them to really play with the data and kind of iterate quickly on new ideas. And um, they can build uh, a report. And here's um, an example of something that we've made. This is a Twitter account report. I know it's kind of small because actually the report is much longer than this, but um, I'm just showing the top. So. Um, it's essentially the first sheet of an, Excel, of an Excel workbook. So the other sheets would have like all of the raw data in there and some intermediate steps where the analysts like create sort of intermediate values that they would use on this. And this is the first sheet, which is all very graphical. So we've got like this kind of little infographic thing at the top and all the numbers that are in there are pulled from the data. And then we have all these charts and like information about the charts and um, so it's like this really kind of rich um, report that's all built in Excel. And so it allows our analysts to focus on designing for the data and not have to think about like systems design or programming or anything like that. Like it's a great tool for putting together this kind of thing and then it becomes a product for our customers. So they come into our web application, generate one of these reports and then they download it and view it in Excel. Um, another benefit of, of using Excel um, for us is that it gives users access to their data in kind of a tangible way. Um, and what I mean by that is like, instead of having to log into the application and just to view their data, it's actually sitting on their hard drive, right? Because they've downloaded a whole bunch of these Excel reports and they can go look at it whenever they want. And they even have the flexibility to go like change these charts um, or do their own analysis even in different software. But most of the time they use Excel too. So we're kind of giving them the data in a format that they're used to. And they get that feeling of kind of owning it because it's tangible. It's like sitting right there on their computer. It's not like locked away in our application. So the next big question is why would we put this in the browser? Well, first thing is because we can and it's awesome. But um, uh, again, it's a big focus on data design. If we, can, if we can put the same experience in a web browser, then what we've done is we've turned all of our data analysts into web developers because now they can build a web dashboard just by tinkering in Excel. Um, it also is a, a big plus for the workflow. Um, for our customers, if they want to download um, all these Excel reports, then they have to kind of switch back and forth between their browser and Excel whenever they want to like, come back to the application and download a new report. Um, and it just gives them choices. So if they want to share, um, share a link to this instead of having to email around a document, they, can, they kind of have more options now. Like they've got Excel where they can look at all the raw data and they can email it and they can keep it. And then they've got the web version where they can just have their whole team have easy access to it. Um, and then the one crazy thing that it allows us to do is um, if they want, the customer can actually modify the dashboard that we've created for them in Excel and then re-upload it back to the web and share it with their, um, with their coworkers. So this is the same report in a web browser, 
Um, the only thing that's really different about it visually is at the very top we've got buttons there. So this is, this is what you would see if you generated a report in our application now. Instead of downloading Excel, it has a button up at the top. They're kind of tiny, but the middle button says download to Excel. And so you click that and you get the full version that has not just this front sheet with all the colorful, shiny stuff, but it has all the, the data underneath. Um, so the next question would be, why JavaScript? Um, and really, this kind of boils down to why not do this on the server side? Because we could, we could theoretically build like all this Excel rendering stuff on the server and just kind of serve up images to the browser. Um, but we chose to go with JavaScript for a couple of reasons. Um, uh, one thing is it's faster to download just the library, uh, JavaScript library and all the data, um, because that's all really compressible and it's just text. Um, but it also allows us to do things like if we want to animate any of the charts or make them interactive. We have a lot more options if we have like complete control over it in the browser and we're actually building this out of like HTML and CSS and SVG and um, you know native browser stuff. Um, and actually, a kind of bonus, which I was not designing this for, but it turns out um, it works on Retina display is great because everything is SVG and um, everything is vector, so it just kind of scales up great and looks amazing, which um, was a big plus. So um, the other the other thing about it is um, our analysts are working in Excel all the time and creating new reports, and when they do that, it, it's so fast for them to iterate because all they have to do is like you know click and change the colors or whatever they want to do in Excel or make a new chart. And then um, it would be difficult if we had to work on some sort of heavy server-side component whenever we needed to add new features to support what they're doing. Because we can't implement all of Excel. We're just going to do everything that we need in order to support the reports that we're making. And so the speed of iteration in JavaScript is really fast. We can deploy quickly because we're just kind of putting new files up on the server. We can um, add new features really easily. Um, and that's, that's a really good benefit so that we can kind of keep parity with what the uh, but the crazy people who are like awesome at Excel are building and kind of pushing the limits of Excel, we can mirror that in the browser. So um, now I'm just going to kind of talk about the setup, like how how do we do this? Um, so the thing, uh, the the major three functions of Excel that we need to copy and and have work in the browser um, are charts, shapes, and tables. Um, so chart is just what you think it is. Shapes, there's actually all these drawing tools in Excel. So almost everything you can do in like PowerPoint, you can you can draw it in Excel as well. So there's preset shapes, like you can just drop like a little heart shape or a little square shape into your document, change the colors. There's also freehand drawing tools, which are not great, but you can also import um, vector images from other programs into Excel, and then they become like vector objects inside the spreadsheet. And then tables, there's actually a, a tables feature in Excel, but that's not what this is. Um, it's just something we came to call tables. What it really is is just like a region of an Excel spreadsheet that's been styled to look like a table of data. So like we make all the cells one color, so it's a background, and then we take some of them and give them a different background, and then we put borders and then a header, and so it starts to look like a table of data instead of just a giant sea of cells. And so these are the three major things that we use in our reports that we wanted to also have work online. And so for each of these, we went with a library that would help us render them so that we didn't have to do the work of kind of figuring out, like, how do you even render charts? So we went with high charts for the charts part, great charting library. Um, Raphael is a great um, drawing library for JavaScript. Um, both of these are based on um, SVG and VML. And uh, with tables, we didn't really, like, there isn't really anything out, out there except you know, what the browser is already capable of, which is to use a table tag. Um, it's a little more complicated than that, though. The main difference between the way that Excel renders things and the way that the web browser does is it completely handles, like, all of the um, text alignment really differently. So when text spills out of a cell or, um, like, how it aligns inside of that cell, all that's very different. And so we just had to kind of do some JavaScript and CSS magic on that to make it happen. Um, so those are the three kind of major parts that we have to tackle. Um, and, and this is a really basic architecture of how we set this up. So we've got these libraries, um, and we need to give them information in order for them to do their job. And all, all of them take just a big data structure. So that data structure would have, like, which div do you want to render this into? And like, what background color should the chart have? And where should it be positioned? And 
you know, what's the minimum and maximum of each axis, and how many data points are there, and what are the data points, and what color are they, and is it a bar chart or a line chart, and just on and on, all this information. So we need to feed that into those libraries um, in order to get the output to look right. And then on the other hand, uh, this other side we have a service, which for us was, um, it basically is taking all the raw data from Excel, which um, under the hood, Excel spreadsheets are just um, a series of files that have been zipped together, and they're all XML. So, and Microsoft has specified, like they've published the spec for all this. It's not the best spec, but it does exist. Um, so we've got all the data, we just kind of sort of uh, leave it in basically the same representation, except for in this case, it would be in JSON instead of XML. Um, and we push that into the browser, and then this thing in the middle is responsible for taking like all this raw data about how does this thing look, like all the colors, all the placement, all the text, all the number formatting, everything, and feeding it into what these libraries understand. And a lot of the work here is actually like you're adding a lot of information. So the same kind of information that Excel would add when it like reads a file off your computer and says, oh, I know what that means. We have to do things like when it says draw a yellow star, we're expanding that into, okay, like that means this specific color yellow. It means draw you know, a point here and then a line from that point and then another line and then another line. Like all the specific instructions need to get um, expanded in that middle step. Um, so there's all this hard-coded stuff that's in Excel and in their specification, and that's like most of what the library is doing. It's just kind of translating data from one format, this arbitrary Excel format, into another arbitrary format that these libraries can understand. Um, but it's a lot of transformation. Um, but then we're thinking about kind of keeping ourselves sane while we do this. We might want to add another little piece, which would be responsible for kind of firewalling off the the high chart specific stuff and the Raphael specific stuff from everything else because if we wanted to replace one of those libraries with a different drawing library in the future, it would be, it would be really difficult to do that if we didn't have like a component that's sort of responsibility was to just know what high charts format is because that doesn't really have anything to do with Excel. So I, I tried to keep it that way where like almost all the code just knows about Excel, doesn't know anything about the, the final output it's just enriching the data with all the things we know from the Excel spec that we need to do, like what colors they're going to be, and just all the stuff that's built into Excel, all that knowledge. And then the, the adapter part, which is this last thing, is going to be responsible for taking that and putting in a format that can be output to these libraries. So in theory, you could rewrite the adapter and then plug in a different charting library or a different shapes drawing library, and, and you'd still work. Um, I don't think we'll ever do that. Um, but, but it was kind of a good exercise in terms of thinking about how to build this. So um, there's also all kinds of different things we could get into about like how we split apart the architecture under, underneath the hood. And I think that was one of the biggest struggles I had in this project was just thinking about how, how to approach this because it's such a large scope. And um, so I want to talk a little about the kind of philosophy behind some of our, our thinking. Um, so this quote sort of haunted me as I was writing this. Um, Alan Perlis, he said, it's better to have 100 functions operate on one data structure than 10 functions on 10 data structures. And I think this is true, but I kind of had like a gut feeling that it was true, and I didn't really know how to explain it to myself even at the time. But I just thought, I need to be careful here, or else I'm going to end up with a really difficult to maintain library um, when I'm done. And so um, I think the kind of the thrust of this quote is that um, you want to reduce the kind of the number of data structures that you have. And I think really he's probably talking about Lisp here where you really only have one data structure. You have lists and then you have all these different functions that operate on lists and functions that take other functions and you build everything up from there. Um, but if you think about JavaScript, like it's so flexible. You can do, f you know, that kind of programming like purely functional programming or you can go like crazy object oriented and build all kinds of new data structures and use those. And so you really have a lot of tools at your disposal using JavaScript because of its flexibility. Um, and so if you think about JavaScript also, like it only has, I mean, if you're trying to be as pure as in that quote, there really are kind of two major data structures that you have in JavaScript. You have arrays and hashes or JavaScript objects. And that's kind of it in terms of built-in data structures that almost everything else is created out of. Um, and so if, if, so if you want to kind of take the um, purely functional approach to this, then you know, you've got, that's your data, and then you would build a whole bunch of functions to go with that. And 
this seems nice because it's so simple, and um, there's a lot of benefits to this. Like, it's really easy to test pure functions that just take a value in and always return the same result out for that input. Um, and so we built a lot of the architecture this way, like just a lot of functions that are specific to Excel, like number formatting and just all kinds of stuff that, that um, we need to write lots of unit tests for. And then on the other hand, you kind of approach um, it this way, which is like JavaScript gives you the ability to create new data structures, right? You can create these, um, these objects and define methods on them. And that's really enticing and kind of convenient because um, it sort of maps to the world, right? Like your problem space, in this case, is Excel. And there's things like collections of charts. Like you've got a line chart type, there's a bar chart type, there's a pie chart type, and they're all charts, and they want to share code. And it really feels like it would fit well into this kind of object-oriented world where you have everything kind of inherit from itself, and they're all sharing code. And, um, and so that's really convenient and kind of appealing. Um, and so I'm thinking about this, and I'm thinking, well, how do I, how do I kind of keep myself on the data and function side of things when it seems so obvious that this stuff maps really well to object-oriented programming, and I just don't want to end up like creating a mess on my hands, and I don't know how to balance these two. Um, so I, I think there's not like any one right way to do this, but it was helpful for me to kind of step back and think about um, like what what are the benefits of each of these? And, and the, the main thing about this is state. Like, they handle state differently. So pure functions, when you want to change the state of something, you pass a bunch of data in that function, and it changes. And that's your state changing, is the input versus the output. But when you're dealing with objects and methods, you like send a message to an object, and then the object is responsible for changing the state behind the scenes. And the whole point of it is that it's hidden, right? Like, you don't have to deal with, once you've built that object, you don't have to deal with how it manages state. But um, state is a real problem in uh, big programs like this. And if it's hidden from you, I think that's kind of where you run into trouble. Um, and then if you kind of step back from this, sort of realize that the original architecture looks a lot like that pure functional model. I mean, it's basically taking in data and putting out data. And every time the same data comes in, the same data goes out on the other side. I mean, both of these are just data. Um, there's no objects in there. In fact, I think it's really curious that um, we're all sort of, I think, I feel as if in the culture of like programming, there's a, there's a really big sort of movement of like, I don't know, people are enamored with object-oriented programming, and then at the same time, people are kind of interested in functional programming, and they're like, but what in the world looks like that? Like, the world isn't just math, it's like things. And um, I think when you think about your architectures that you build for a lot of projects, you'll see that we're already doing this, right? When you have code running on two different servers or you have code running in two different languages, you almost always end up gluing them together with something that looks a lot like this. Like you just take data in one side and data comes out the other and you're not, you know, you can like take an object and serialize it and then like deserialize it on the other side. But people have really shied away from things like SOAP and, um, you know, XML or PC because this seems easier, like just turn it into JSON or XML, use REST, like just pass it along. Um, and so I, I think that's something to think about if you're trying to kind of do what I was doing, which is like figure out how to make things more functional and more um, kind of simple with, and you don't really know what in the world to look at as a model for that. I think the applications we build, the web applications we build are a good model for it. Um, and then, so if you are interested in doing that and you kind of want to take the more functional approach, Underscore is a really wonderful library in JavaScript for doing this. Um, it gives you all these great functions like map and reduce and detect and each and just on and on. There's a whole bunch of them. And these are really like the basic building blocks of functional programs. And once I had this library and added it to, to the project, I just used it everywhere. Like uh, everything became so malleable, like just all these data translations and changing one thing to another becomes really easy with these tools. Um, so I highly recommend looking at that if you're interested in this kind of approach to um, building like a big JavaScript library. There's also uh, another one out there called Sugar.js, which I've looked at the documentation a lot and haven't had a chance to use it in the project, but um, it's a similar um, idea, a lot of functional um, stuff, but it, it doesn't take the same approach. Um, so kind of different flavors for different people. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's basically it. Um, Simply Measure is looking for people. We're um, 
actually specifically going to be hiring a JavaScript developer, so people who are interested in hacking on JavaScript and working on crazy stuff like this, um, I'd love to talk to you.